35 to 70, 75 grams of carbs, depending on your metabolism or your training. Uh, you got DC training. Anybody heard of DC training? It's a very low, it's a very popular method of training. It's been in all the magazines for the last two, three years. Uh, dog crap training, DC stands for dog crap. It's based off of the intense muscle site. Very, very popular training. Probably the most popular training program out there right now for putting in muscle. It has been two, three, maybe even four years. But it's a very low volume approach. So I'm using that type of a training style as an example. Look, if you're training really low volume, you don't need a lot of carbs post workout. It's just, you're just not going to need it. Even in the off season, you're not going to need it. If you're training high volume, let's say you're doing 20 sets of back and five sets of traps, and, you know, that sort of thing, you're coming off of a workout of 30, you know, 30 some sets, 25 sets. Your carbohydrate intake is going to need a demand for carbohydrate. Post workout is going to be a lot higher. Now, <clears throat> Kid cereal, um, I'm, I'm thinking of some examples. I use kid cereal. You can actually take your, your protein drink, mix it with water, of course, and use it as kind of milk in a bowl of cereal. It goes down real easy. Um, those are the only uh, high GI or processed carbs you're going to get during the week. You don't have that meal when you don't weight train. You don't have it after cardio. After cardio, you want to save your, pro fat, your protein and fat. If you have to do cardio later in the day because your, uh, you know, your schedule doesn't allow it in the morning for whatever reason, job, you get up at 3.30 in the morning and you can't get up any earlier, put your cardio either after or before a protein and fat meal. Try to keep it as far away from a carb meal as you possibly can, okay, because I guarantee you, and, you know, uh, you can argue the off-season versus getting lean. This is, we're talking about getting lean. When you're depleted, trust me, those carbs in that carb meal, they're in your last two and a half, three hours. You're not going to have a high blood sugar level 30 minutes before your next meal after taking the carb to the point where it's going to ruin or take away the effectiveness or efficiency of a cardio session. And again, I will say this, and this is just another reminder of eating this, it's still better to do your cardio after or before a carb meal than not doing it at all. You're still going to benefit. It's just not going to be ideal. Okay. So I don't, I don't want to give the impression. Well, you said if it's around carb meal, then okay, I'm not doing my. It's not going to work, so I'm not doing it. That's not what I'm saying. All I'm saying is ideally, it's going to be that much more productive and efficient if you don't have blood an elevated blood sugar level. If you don't have carbs. In now, post-workout, we're getting here. Uh, I take in my cereal. I take in my protein drink. You want liquid or very easily digested food after you train so that your body can suck it up. It's just going to be a whole lot more efficient than if you sat down to a potato and a steak. It's just much slower digestion. You want it fast. Your muscles are acting like sponges at that point. They'll suck it, just suck it up real fast. Again, go by hunger. Because once you start to get hungry again after the cereal and everything else, get the food. Well, how long is it going to be? It could be 15 minutes. It could be 45 minutes. Okay? It's going to depend even on, you know, there, there are variables in there that are going to change Mondays. And I'm going to be terribly hungry on Monday. Because you just came off of the skip load. Because you, and you've eaten a lot of food. So you're kind of still a little out here. And you're like, oh my God, I don't want to eat that chicken and vegetable. But by Wednesday, you'll be liking those vegetables. It won't be too bad. So you're, you're not going to be as hungry coming off the refeed. <clears throat> you may have a bigger gap in between your meals than you will later in the week. And if you get to the point, too, where later in the week you're hungry, you push your meals together, they're two hours apart, but you've got four hours before you go to bed. Here's the rule, and it's simple. If you're awake, you eat. It's just that simple. Now, on the other side, if you have six meals planned for the day, and you're tired. Man, it's Friday night, you've worked all week, and you're like, man, I gotta stay up to get this last meal. Hell no. Given the choice between food and sleep, sleep. Okay? When you sleep, that's where most of your recovery and your rest come from. Plus, hormonally, you've got everything from growth hormone release happening, that that is where most of the growth is happening. The, if you were to take the meal, and what you benefit from eating that meal, 
versus skipping it and going to bed, it's like this. Forget the meal, just get your ass in bed and go to sleep. You know, if you're hungry and you're starving and you gotta wait 15 minutes, that's the difference. That's that's up to you. You gotta wait an hour and a half and you can barely keep your eyes open, go to sleep. After this meal here, I'm gonna go back to a car meal. Again, to me, pro car, I keep turning the damn thing to car now. So you probably can't see it. <laughs> Bear with me. Um, I'm going to have one more meal after here. It's not going to be carbs. I don't like carbs at that time. I know that sounds very um, old school or kind of archaic. Look, you can eat carbs before you go to bed if you train late. Okay? You can even have your kid's cereal that's high GI, highly processed carbs before you go to bed. It's not ideal, but they're carbs that are being sucked up anyway. So it's they're needed, the muscles are demanding fluid, carbohydrate, and essentially amino acids. So you still, even if you train, some people will train two hours before they go to bed. And they only have an hour after they get home and then they're going to bed. It's not ideal because arguably the carbs will get in the way of, a, of your growth hormone release when you hit that first REM cycle of your sleep. But look, again, it's the lesser of the evil. You need the carbs. You can't, it's not a good idea in my opinion, and I understand that, you know, Dave Palumbo or someone else who does and specializes in keto and very low carb diets will tell you, you don't need the carbs post-workout. They're not that important. I say they are. And I'm not saying I'm right. I'm saying there's a million different ways to get to the end result. My opinion is that you need the carbs post-workout even if you're getting ready for bed. And unless you're going to go over the amount of carbs you need, it likely isn't going to get in the way of your growth hormone release, your sleep, or anything else. Okay? So I'm going to keep that last meal pro fat. Why would you take in fat? You're going to bed. What do you need calories for? Well, number one, I'm not waking up in the middle of the night wanting to gnaw my arm off because I'm so damn hungry. Okay? I don't want to have dreams about Twinkies and ding dongs and things like that. Uh, it satiates. You don't need a lot, but you need enough to satiate so that you can, hope, frankly, go to bed. Okay? Leaving fat out, in my opinion, low-fat diets is a really bad idea. You need essential fatty acids. You need the satiety from eating. Look, you know, people say, well, you shouldn't use peanut butter or nuts because they have carbs in them. They have carbs in them, but they have such an insignificant amount of carbs and this is another thing that I do with my diet. I don't count the macros. When I used to say I'm shooting for 200 grams of carbs in a day, I'm going to count the carbs in my carb sources. I'm not going to count them in, say, peanut butter, which is a fat source, and it's 6 grams of carbs or 5 grams of carbs. I can care less. Why? Because I'm not counting on those carbs for my carb intake for my energy level for that day. Much like I'm not going to count the protein in the open, as an example. When I say I want 350 grams of carbs, and I'm using that as a, as a number two for the sake of discussion, I want 350 grams of protein in a day. I'm not counting protein in oatmeal is crap. It's not going to help me with growth. It's not going to help me maintain muscle mass because it's not a quality, complete protein source. I'm going to count the protein in my happy to mistake in my chicken breast, that sort of thing. I'm also not going to count, and this one might throw you a little bit. This is just the way that I've always done things. And I'll explain why it's easier to, to, to follow it this way here in a second. And we need to take a quick break because I'm getting restless. And if I'm getting restless, you guys have to be getting restless. And when we come back, I'm going to get into, and I'm just going to go full board into the skip load. And we'll move into to the last things here. And these are going to be quick. It's not going to take a long time. And uh, get into some questions. What's that? Don't you count the carbs. Don't count yeah, don't count the carbs. Here, and here's why. Um, and it's the same thing with not counting the fat in the lean protein sources, like the chicken breast and anything else. So if you get into fatter meat, like 93 sevens and stuff like that, you have to count them. salmon. You have to count them because it's such a, it's just a higher level of fat. The reason I don't do that is this: I'm going to set up a plan, and I'm going to say I want X amount of carbs, X amount of protein, X amount of fat not counting the trace shit that's all over the place. Now I might have an end calorie intake of, let's say 2,500. 
here's the catch. It's not really 2,500. It might be closer to 3,000, 2,900. Okay, but for the sake of what we're doing and the adjustments that we're going to go through, as I adjust with a client or adjust my diet myself, I'm going to drop, say, from 200 grams of carbs down to 100 grams of carbs. The method and the protocol stays the same. So it's consistent. It's much like if you have a scale at home that doesn't read accurately. I know that's hard to believe because all you know scales are so accurate. But if it's five pounds off, but you get on it every week and you lose two pounds, who gives a shit? Now, it'll matter when it comes time to weigh in because you will need to know your end, but it doesn't matter for the course of progress. And it's the same thing with the diet. This way, doing it this way, you know you're getting 350 grams of quality protein. You're not getting 60 from oatmeal that doesn't mean shit anyway. Okay? Now, the fat, that one is the only one that could really be argued because people say, well, you're taking the fat anyway. That's true, but it's still a constant. The only fat that you're going to keep track of is the additional dietary fat, like you know, your clean fats, like your nuts, uh, oils, things like that. Or if you go with a higher, and I don't recommend going with a higher meat source anyway. Look, if you're going to go and you say, well, I'm, uh, you told me to take in 24 grams of fat on top of my lean source. I'm going to go with 85-15 beef. No, you're not. Because, number one, it's not healthy. Two, saturated fat works completely different in the body than it is metabolized differently than a clean fuel source or a clean fat source. Plus, it doesn't get anywhere near the same. Look, you ever eat 85-15 beef or you eat 96-4 beef with nuts? Trust me, get dieting. Get hungry, and you're going to want the fucking nuts over the shitty beef. Again, you know, I touched on the fact that it's, it's probably better to do it on the weekend. It's just better to do it on a day where, look, there's, there's, a, there's a drawback, okay? If you don't eat carbs or that many carbs throughout the week, then you eat a whole bunch of them. Anybody care to take a stab at what's going to happen? Well, let's, I'll go this way. <laughs> Do you guys know, the girls will know, party light? The can, the candle, isn't it the candle? Yeah, you know. My wife put on stock in it because come 6 o'clock at night, we got to have candles burn. Okay? You're going to get gas. Your, your system isn't used to it. You're going to get gas. Okay? Um, and the longer the refeed, and the more depleted, and the leaner you are, the worst of this part. You don't want to be sitting at work in a cubicle having gas every minute. And I'm, I mean, I'm kind of funny. Because I mean, I'm pretty funny. <laughs> but it gets not funny. I've been with my wife for 19 years. I've competed all those years. And I still get from her. God, you stink. Why do you have to do that? Uh, because I'll blow up if I don't. I mean, there isn't much option. Okay, so it's just one. It, it's gonna. I mean, it's just something that you, you gotta know going in. It's it's gonna happen. So try to, like I say, scheduling it on a day where you don't have to train. The reason that you want it on a day that you don't have to train is because as we as you get deeper into the lean, you get leaner, you get more depleted. The size of the refeed, it's gonna get bigger. Okay, and when I say bigger. For reference, this is usually how it goes. When when I recommend someone to start out with a with a refeed or with a skip mode, it's usually a six hour window. Okay? And I gauge how long the skip load is in hours. It used to be meals. If I remember what I found was if I said, Well, you got three meals, well all of a sudden those meals are this big, okay, and they're six hours apart. And that isn't what I was after. So I had to start measuring with hours, okay? So as an example, if you're going to start with six hours, essentially what you're going to do is you're going to get as many carbs into your system as you can handle without being miserable or uncomfortable, which is takes some practice. Because you're going to be hungry coming into that day. And when you get those carbs, it just tastes so much better than sweet potatoes and oatmeal you're going to start throwing them down, okay? Now, there are some, some basic rules to the structure. Number one, you're still going to eat every two to three hours. And when I say eat, 
it, it's a minimum for every two or three hours. You're going to get your usual protein intake, and I spilled that on my marker, but I'm going to write anyway. Usual protein intake every two to three hours. Okay. So if I say you're going to start with a six-hour window for your first skip load, you're also going to start that load as early in the day as possible. Because I do get the question, and I understand why. Hey, can I, you know, I go to church in the morning, and we usually do Sunday dinner with the family, so can I do the six hours before I go to bed? It's not ideal. Look, if, if your schedule and your lifestyle says that that's the best move, then go ahead and do that. Earlier in the day is better just because it's going to, uh, two things. Number one, it's going to hit your metabolism hard because you're coming straight out of the gates with all these carbs and with all these calories, okay? It also is going to allow you, once the six-hour window is done, you need to be back on your usual, uh, it'll be a non-training day diet uh, because you're not going to be training on the refeed. Ideally, you're going to be training on your refeed day. So what you're going to do is you're going to have that six-hour window. You're going to be doing your meals, you're going to be doing your protein every two to three hours, but then you're taking your protein, say it's 50 grams of protein, and that's what, you know, again, just throwing out a number. 50 grams of protein, eat that first, and then you're going to fill up on carbs for the rest of that meal. You're literally going to eat them until you're full and satisfied, and, you know, I mean, you're full, you're like, okay, you know, I'm full. But not miserable, like, God, my stomach's going to rip, you know, I need to go to the bathroom and come back and eat more. Uh, I need to go puke and come back and eat more. I mean, it's not extreme. You just need to fill up and be full. In between these protein meals, in between the meals during the skip load window of six hours, what we're using now again, it's going to go from there. It's going to grow. The leaner you get, the more depleted you get, the more carbs you're going to need. To the point where most people, I don't say most people, I'll say 60% of people will be going from the time they wake up to the time they go to bed. I have some people, myself included, that for the last three or four weeks before a show, I have to actually start the night before, for a couple hours before I go to bed, because the entire refeed for that one day is not enough. Okay, I'll get into why and how you tell how much there is, how I tell how much it is, how much you need, whether it's enough, that sort of thing. But you're going to need two, three hours of protein. Look, if you eat and an hour later you're hungry, and you can eat, if you have room in your stomach, if you're hungry, your body's using them carbs, sucking them up, packing them away, eat again. Okay? What I would say is, if it's only been an hour, don't eat your protein meal again. Just graze on just carbs. Whether it's grabbing, you know, granola bars, I'll get into the foods here in a second. Um, to hold you over until your next meal. And the meal just dictates that you're going to be taking in your protein. You still got to take in your protein intake. Now, I do, I, I already raised it. There are updates. There are some things that I'm changing, so I'll get to the protein in a minute. But I want to make sure that the basic structure that I'm explaining all of the details. So, over the course of six hours, you're going to get roughly three meals. Okay? And if there we get to three meals, but some people are like, wow, I understand that's only two meals. What the hell is the problem? You're going to eat the one that starts the six hours? Okay. At least none of you are following getting that. Anyway, you're going to get about three meals in those six hours, okay? You have more markers down there. I'm sorry. I can't hear you running the camera. No, I know they don't work either. Those skinny ones. Oh, I got one height back there, don't I? Smart ass camera. Oh, there we go. Um, you're going to get about three meals in there. Anyway, once the six hours is done, you're shutting down your carbs. You're going to be plenty full. You're, you might not want to eat for a few hours after that. But you're going to go right back, which is essentially probably going to be, for most people, you're going to be going to your protein and fat. Okay? So I say for most because as you get later in the day, most non-training day diets are not going to be terribly big in carbs at that point, okay? Now, as far as fluid intake, ideally, you want your fluid intake to be the same. Why? Because to pack away carbs as glycogen, you know, we all need a three to one ratio, you know, they're coming from black and white numbers. You gotta have your water in there so it's an efficient process of putting carbs away and storing them as glycogen in the muscle. However, you're going to be very full. And when you try to add in fluid, you're going to be really 
helpful to the point where, it, 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 again, it, it comes back to practice. You're, you're gonna, if you're not gonna get it right the first week, you're not likely gonna bounce it the second or the third week. It takes some practice to get into how much to eat at each meal, okay? And we also aren't counting carbs, okay? And I say that and people say, oh my gosh, how am I gonna know how much to eat? This is, this part, as far as the skin loading, is hunger based. Trust me when I say that, it, because the skin loading can be done in the off season as well, if you're a bodybuilder or you're adding muscle and that sort of thing. I'm not gonna get into that too much right now because the focus here is getting leaner. But the point is, the hunger will tell you based on how depleted your muscles are, You, the hunger will tell you all, very, very accurate how much you're gonna need, how much carbs you're gonna need over the course of the day. Look, if you come out of a six hour, your first skip load, and you're still hungry, now obviously there are other factors you gotta watch your weight when you baseline on these that in a second. But it's an important, no, or an important variable that if you come out of your schedule and you're still hungry, that it's likely that it has to be bigger. Okay? And when I say bigger, I mean longer. Well, if you're eating is the car the amount of carbs that you're supposed to in that six hour window and you're getting full, and if you get hungry in, in an hour later and you're grazing to help keep carbs in you, then it's likely that it will have to be longer. Okay? What I do with my clients, most of my clients, is I will have them outline the first two, three, four loads of time that they ate the food. Just an outline it as best they can to tell me the types of food they ate, when they ate, how much they ate, not counting carbs, but explaining what they had so that I can look at it and say, okay, how hungry were you? And then we'll take a look at your weight and things like that to see how efficient the load is. Here's an example. If you come out of the gates with your, with your first meal and you just stuff yourself, and then it's two or three hours later and you're barely able to eat much because you're still so full, that's where the practice comes in because the first meal then is too big. There is an ideal balance and it is hard to hit. There's an ideal balance how much you're going to eat, how full you're going to be for that first meal so that you're ready to eat for the second meal and balancing that with the third meal because, again, it comes back to efficiency. If you just bog your system down with a massive meal right out of the gates, you're not going to get as many carbs as you could get if you balance those meals better. Okay, and that's where you think, well, i got to count them. I understand the logic, but throw it in the toilet. <laughs> If you, if you insist on keeping track of it, because we all have our issues, I have my control issues as well, so it is hard to give that up. You're giving up a black and white, something that's very black and white, easily measurable, and you're creating a gray area. Hmm, scary. So here's the crap out of me. <laughs> that's why I had a hard time adjusting to it too. However, you still need to focus on the hunger. When you start counting cards, you're gonna freak yourself out, especially the women. Sorry, I know I'm singling you out. But if you look and you go, oh my, I just ate 900 grams of carbs. Look, I've had 120 pound figure women out eat bodybuilders that weigh 200 pounds. Because they're doing it right and they've balanced and they've gotten, and I know uh, when my wife competed in 2008, I had to force her to eat. And I mean, look, it sounds great. Ooh, it's man, I'm in the middle without any pancakes and syrup or anything else. Oh, it's great for one meal, and then it sucks if you're doing it right, because it's a chore. It's a chore to eat because you're not going to be hungry like you were at the first meal. You're, I mean, sometimes you get so much, you hit the car so much that you start to get kind of sleepy from the insulin response, and it starts, you know, and, you know I get this, oh, I feel lethargic, I just want to take a nap, and that'll be, your body adjusting to and getting used to that type of feeding and that amount of carb, quite frankly. So types of foods, real easy. High carb, processed carb, low fiber, because fiber, the higher fiber intake, just like the higher the fat intake, will slow down the rate of that carbohydrate, hits your bloodstream. You want the insulin response. Look, you're not burning body fat on the refeed day. Sorry, it's just not gonna happen. But it's the benefit that you get from the higher carb intake, 
the higher calorie intake, it's like throwing gas on a fire when it comes to your metabolism. You're, you're essentially stoking your metabolism for the following week. Okay? Throughout the course of the week when you're getting depleted, your body, look, the body is, is resilient. It's going to adjust. Try very, very hard to adjust and find a balance between the calories that you're taking in and it's going to adjust on metabolism. It's just like a survival type of, um, you know, a survival type of thing. By the time you're depleted, your metabolism is slowing down at the end of the week, you're going to refeed. Once those calories go up, and you'll find this, most of you will experience it, you're going to get hot, you're going to be sweaty, and you're like, they're all on fire, why is it so hot in there? That is the part where you're throwing the gas on the fire, you're stoking the metabolism, you're getting hotter, your temperature is coming up, and it's a great thing. Your body's responding to the higher caloric intake. Okay? When you come into that next, you're going to gain water weight, your weight's going to go up. It, it's just going to. It can go up two pounds. It can go up five. I got guys, I did a load for this last show, I went 14 pounds. Okay? It happens. You're going to water over. You're going to get thicker, you know, you're, you're going to carry more water, you're going to hold water weight, so you're going to get a little thicker. When you go back to your diet the day after on Monday, assuming that you're doing your skip load on Sunday, once you go back to that lower caloric intake, your metabolism's up here. It's on fire, it's running crazy, but your caloric intake's down here again. Okay? Throughout the course of the week, this is what happens Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but you're still burning body fat. What Thursday, Friday? By the time the balance is on, ooh, time to refeed again. It's a constant, there's your cycle. Okay? Now, are you going to be off by a day or two? Maybe. That's where, like as an example, and this is where we watch your weight and everything else, we talk about baseline here in just a second. Well, I, I referred to that word a few times, so I'm saying it needs to in a second. If you're off by a couple days and you're dropping, you know, you've dropped four pounds, that's when we know, or you know, that you have to change the caloric intake during the week that it's likely too low. Okay? It's possible that you can go with higher rate feed. Okay? Now, for me to teach you that, that's incredibly difficult to do. If you're working with me, then I'm going to know and I'm going to be able to see whether the calories need to go up during the week or whether the refeed needs to be increased. Okay, but back to the refeed as far as food. High processed carbs, high carb, low fat. Here's the next question. I get it all the time. How much fat? There is no number. This is what you do. The fat needs to be as low as possible, not because if you eat fat, you're going to get fat. But because if, if, well, the higher the fat intake, you're, you're going to satiate quicker. You're going to get full quicker. You want to get full eating as many carbs as you can. Fat doesn't have the impact on your metabolism that carb intake does. Plus, the fat intake doesn't really do a whole lot for you. At least when you take the carbs in, you're filling your muscles out and you're storing glycogen. You're going to benefit from that coming into the next week with your training because your muscles are going to fill out, they're going to contract harder, you're going to have great pumps for two or three days, and your strength is going to be a little higher before you start to compete again and start to what is essentially go flat again. Okay? Now, some people cringe at that, they're like, flat, I don't want to go out. Yeah, look, if you can't handle going flat while you're on a diet to get very lean, especially if you're a competitor, you've got to take up a different sport. Because to get crazy lean, to get into sick condition, you're going to go flat at some point during that week, later in the week. But it almost has to happen. Your glycogen stores are going to deplete because you're in a restricted caloric environment, plus you're restricting your carbs. You are car essentially, like we said, carb cycling, just not in the traditional way. Okay, so some ideas of foods. Number one, like I said, I own IntenseMuscle.com. There is a thread on the main page that says, skip approved, skip loaded foods, or something to that effect. It is a huge thread with nothing but recipes, ideas, foods from clients, past clients, members, and I've approved them all, so there's nothing there that doesn't count. There's some good shit in there. Some stuff that I don't know. I don't to try that. But here's some ideas for you. Again, we come back to the kids here on low fat pop tarts because those you already know because you eat those post workout. Uh, spaghetti with, you know, a kind of a low fat, like a marinara, even a ragu, those types of um, spaghetti sauces. You can, granola bars, cereal bars, bagels, um, 
Gosh. Throw, throw some stuff at me here. Yes, absolutely. Pop um, I, I actually was using low fat, or um, Ben and Jerry's Pro Yogurt, frozen yogurt. Um, I'm not huge on dairy. I gotta tell you real quick. As far as dairy is concerned, if you're going with straight milk or ice cream, it will slow digestion. Anybody, I mean, you drink milk and you get that, that I call it scum, milk scum in the mouth. It, it coats your mouth. It does the same thing to your small intestine. It makes digestion slow or slow down. It also makes you distend because the walls are covered with that scum. Look, the nutrients can't get through the wall like they otherwise can. It's not as efficient of a process. Now, I don't want to get into, I'm not a dairy hater, okay? All I'm saying is, if you have milk in your diet, a substantial amount of milk, you want to see your weights go down two inches in two weeks, and your distension go down and your digestion increase, get the milk out of there. I've never once had somebody take milk out of their diet and say any, anything except, oh my God, I had no idea. Most everybody in the room doesn't tolerate milk like they think they do. Just because you don't get gassy and have farts and have cramps in your stomach doesn't mean that you're lactose tolerant. Okay? It still doesn't help with digestion and it makes it inefficient. It just slows everything down. Now, another question I get sometimes is, well, what about if I have it right before I go to bed? Because then it would help. That is a decent argument. Cottage cheese is an example, and the off-season isn't a bad idea. But if you think you can diet on cottage cheese and take in 30 grams of carbs from the cottage cheese, because it's, cottage cheese ain't terribly low in carbs, before you go to bed, it's not a good idea. Okay? So you can get something there on the refeed if you're having a little bit, and it's in a, it's in a yogurt thing, and it's this. Over the, in the big picture, it's not a big deal. I do not recommend going for four gallons of frozen yogurt or drinking a gallon of milk with your kids in there. That's sort of thing. Angel food cake is good. I'm sorry? Angel food cake, you're right. I'll give you that. Um, gosh, and I'm, and I'm trying to come off the top of my head to give you guys some, some better examples. Um, or more examples. Tokyo Joe's. Well, I mean, if you're going to go out and you're going to go as far as eating out, sushi, uh, places like Tokyo Joe's, if you're careful, they're rice-based. With your sushi, sushi isn't bad at all. You just got to watch primarily two things, avocado content, and because your sushi gets fat primarily because of fatty fish and avocado. Now, you can, you know, there are other things in there. If you get a, a Philadelphia roll, it's got some cream cheese in it or something like that. Salmon, if you ate a bunch of salmon, but the portion of the fish, a lot of times, unless you're just eating 80 pieces of, of a salmon roll, it's not usually going to get you like the avocado and the, the fattier fish. Uh, like as an example, when I say fattier fish, you're better off even with the salmon than you are with like the eel because the eel is just incredibly fat. So you can do sushi, you can do the Tokyo Joe's, you can, uh, uh, I'll tell you what's really good, there's a, there's a place over on Arapaho Road in Aurora that I miss. Actually, it's in Denver, but it's on your way to Aurora. It's called like the Asian Fire Bowl or something like that. Anyway, it's noodle based, uh, very light soup type uh, with noodles in it. Those things, look, as long as you're keeping your fat control and you've got the processed low fiber carbs in there, you're good. Okay? Again, keeping the fat low, not because you're going to get fat or you're going to add body fat, but so that you can get more carbs in. You want to get as many carbs in as you possibly can. Now, baseline. You hit your skip load, and we're using Sunday as an example. You get back on your diet Monday morning, you'll feel a little like a pig because you've got a few more pounds of water on you, but it is what it is. You're going to drop that water over the course of the next two or three days. The baseline means this, and it's, and it's this simple. The weight that you are, the body weight that you are, the morning of your refeed, before you start your refeed, let's say it's 200 pounds. You were 203 the week before, so you dropped three pounds. It's a, it's a decent, a decent week. You're 200 pounds a morning to refeed. It does not matter what you are. Sunday night before you go to bed, I always get these. Oh my gosh, I ate 14 pounds up. It doesn't matter because by the time you get up in the morning, you're likely only going to be up three, four, five pounds. Okay, it depends on how long the refeed is or the skip load. It depends on how big you are. If you're a 240 pound bodybuilder, you're certainly going to hold more water 
than a 140-pound, you know, figure competitor or someone who's looking to use this weight. The baseline means this. Baseline is the 200-pound mark. How long does it take you to baseline? Okay? You should baseline by Wednesday or Thursday. So that means you should drop that water weight and come back to 200 pounds, which is the weight that you were before the refeed on Sunday, by that Wednesday or Thursday. If you hit it sooner, let's say you hit it on Monday or Tuesday, the refeed wasn't big enough. Guaranteed, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It wasn't big enough. So then you'll know coming to the next week, I'm not going six hours. I'm going to go eight to ten. Now, if you baseline late, let's say you don't baseline until Friday or Saturday. Some people don't baseline until Friday or Saturday, and they'll still drop below baseline before it's time to refeed again on Sunday. As long as you have, and, and what you have to watch out for, patterns are huge. So as the weeks go by, you're not going to know much the first week. But as the weeks go by, you're going to see the patterns, and you're going to start baseline right about the same time every week. It's going to be very predictable. Even as your um, loads get bigger, as you get leaner, because you're going to be more depleted, so you're going to, even though your loads are bigger, you're going to be using a lot more of that carbohydrate. Your it's going to have much more of an impact on your metabolism. The leaner you get, the more depleted you get, the bigger the refeed is. And then by bigger, I mean longer throughout the course of the day. So the baseline is important. When I have a client that checks in with me, I want to know the baseline. And when some people say, well, I don't know, gosh, I don't want to take my weight every day. I don't think that's important. Well, you might not think it's important, but I have to see, and you have to see, where the fluctuations are, where the baseline is. Another example, too, is as a bodybuilder, if you train legs on a Tuesday and you're breaking ass on them and they're sore, you are likely to gain a pound or two because of the soreness from the amount of water that you're going to hold from your legs being sore. So you have to take into consideration if you go in and you all of a sudden just rip up legs and you go, oh my gosh, I'm a pound bigger. Well, that's the fluctuation. Those are things that you have to look for and it's part of the pattern. Because when you're not sore or not as sore a couple days later, you might have a big drop. You might drop three pounds a day and you're like, oh my goodness. Well, two of them is probably from the fact that you're not sore, you're not holding as much water, your legs aren't swollen like they were before. Okay? The other thing is when you come off the refeed, and you get into Monday, your water intake, and this is where the water intake is important. Higher, when your water intake is high where it's supposed to be, it's going to cycle through water. Body has no reason, or not much of a reason, to hold water if it has enough water. Okay? You're going to hold water. You want to hold water bad. Don't drink water during your refeed, then start drinking it the next day to see if your ass going to blow up the day after. That's why it's really important to get in as much fluid as you can. You're not going to get your normal fluid intake on the day of the refeed. You're just not. Because the priority is on the food. Even though you still got to get, you know, you want to get the fluid in there. You're probably not going to get it as much during the load, but then when you're done with the load, you go back to, for the latter part of the day, after the refeed, you go back to your regular meals. That's when you want to make sure that you get in as much fluid as you can. You're essentially starting the process of ridding your body of the water at that point when the refeed is over. Baseline is important. But again, you can baseline late in the week, and I have some clients that do it, just not the majority. I'd say 20, you know, 25% of them. We'll baseline that until Friday or Saturday, then they'll still drop. The most important thing is you got to drop below baseline. So if you're 200 pounds and you hit your baseline on Wednesday, from there, you need to, you know, you're going to drop below. You're going to drop below the 200 pound mark. You may end up 199, 198, come to refeed. If you, and then that's a great week, there's no reason to make any changes. Mama said you don't fix what isn't broke. So if you have a good week and your diet is set and you've dropped a couple pounds, you don't change anything. I am, and this is my, this is my day. Other people may do it differently and be more proactive. I'm reactive. I'm going to react to what my body is doing because if it's dropping, look, I go six weeks without making any changes. I don't need to starve myself and do more cardio if I'm dropping weight and getting lean. Again, you don't play with it. Some people say, well, maybe I can lose more. Well, maybe you can. You're greedy son of a bitch. You want to make yourself hungry, cranky, and tired when just because you make a change and do more cardio doesn't mean you're going to drop weight. Maybe your body's going to say, okay, now I'm not running out enough calories and it's not going to be running as efficiently and you're going to stall. Hmm, don't want that. 
One of the most important rules of dieting is take in as many calories as you can to still lose weight and get in. Okay? What that does is it keeps it, I call it a ceiling. The higher you keep the ceiling, the better off you're going to be in the long run because you have more options to continue to progress for a longer period of time. And by a ceiling, it's, it's keeping up here higher caloric intake, lower cardio intake, or cardio expenditure keeps the ceiling high. You have more room to adjust in the future as you get closer to the show. You bring the ceiling down because you've got this much room and you're doing a ton of cardio and you're low on calories and you're 12 weeks out, good luck. Even if you get there, it's going to be, it's going to be torturous. And the dieting, especially dieting this way, is one of the easiest ways you're going to diet ever. Now, I often wonder why there aren't, like as an example, I, I advertise this real well. I would wonder why there aren't a hundred people, never mind that I didn't want them. But I'll tell you why the other 80 didn't show up. Because it's ingrained in our brain a couple things. Number one, he's full of shit. I've heard that before. Other than I've got a track record that is retardedly long and consistent. Uh, there are people who actually don't feel like you're doing it right unless they're starving and dragging ass and they can bitch this and moan about how bad life is. Okay, I have other things to get done and I don't care to drag everybody down around me and hate my life while I'm getting lean and getting ready for, or and or getting ready for a show. So, let's just say that this process got you into the same condition as your last show. Let's just say it didn't get you into better condition. Pick one. Which one is sane? Which one can you actually function? Okay, but the reality is, and I'm telling you this matter of fact, whether it sounds arrogant or not, I don't really care. You'll get into better condition. Because, and, and this is the main reason, with the traditional diet, your metabolism is at the mercy of the calories you're taking in. And if you're not even using a bump in calories, Look, a high carb day of adding, you know, 100 grams of carbs, 400 calories, please. What the hell is that going to do? It's not going to do anything. You're not even going to gain it. You're not even going to know the difference, other than being more hungry the next day from taking in that, <laughs> taking in the higher carbs, which I didn't touch on. And make no mistake, after you get into it a couple of days after the week, you're going to be hungry, and you're going to be hungry primarily because your body's going to be like, uh, I want the big amount of carbs that you just gave me a couple of days ago, because that was all right. I mean, you know, obviously, but it comes down to, in the end, the progress, how the uh, increase in carbs affects your metabolism and keeps you on this constant cycle where a lot of times you're not even changing. Look, the changes you're going to make to your cardio and your regular diet, if you hit it and you get it right, you don't have to make changes to the principles That bump every week, the carb cycle, will continue to have you getting leaner every single week. And the nice thing is, is when it comes down to, say you're doing a bodybuilding show, or even a figure show, when it comes down to loading before the show, this is how you'll load. People say, well, that's not very predictable. You just don't a bunch, of, you're not even counting time. How can you predict? Because I've done it every week for 15, 16, 17, 18 weeks. You'll also hear people say, well, I don't want to prep for 18 weeks. Okay. You don't want to prep 15, 16, 17 weeks where it's easy, and you're getting high carbs once a week. You'd rather be tortured for 12 to 14 weeks. Explain the logic in that. Because that 12 to 14 weeks will feel a whole lot longer than the 18 weeks where you're getting carbs every week. So logically, again, it comes back to the box. They gotta get outside of it because everything in it is incredibly, uh, I don't wanna say it's incredibly ineffective. That's not fair. Diving the traditional way is still effective. I know a lot of good trainers who do it the boring, torturous way. But why? It's archaic, it's outdated. Why? And I still say you'll get in better condition. You will be lean. There are times for this. Last show, two or three weeks, I had to check in my condition because I felt like I was literally in the opposite. I kept checking my condition going, um, okay, okay, you are retarded in And I know that doesn't look like it right now, but that's okay. <laughs>
Now, um, let me just answer this. Is there anything that isn't clear as far as like the baseline? Are there any questions like with the baseline, with the foods, or anything as far as the loading, the, the skip loading itself? I'm just spitting everywhere. Yeah, I hope that doesn't come up on camera. I always make fun of people who are talking, they got their shit on in their mouth and it's all dry. And I'm doing the same thing. So, so on the skip load that you can have like, you can have like three juices and whatnot as well? Is that a good or not so much? I, and I don't know if I touched on the, the high fructose corn syrup enough. I don't recommend, okay, and this is, goes along with drinking. I did used to do that, and I can't say that it doesn't work, but here's the thing. When you're going off of hunger and you're drinking calories, it's harder to gauge hunger because, I mean, you can be full and you can literally drop down easily 100 grams of carbs and be like, you know, in drinking it, like oh, yeah. orange juice yeah. or something, or even pop, because then people would argue, well, what's the difference then between orange juice and pop? And I'm like, ooh, that's a good question. There really isn't. At the same time, um, like I say, the hunger, it's, it's harder to gauge with the hunger. So I say no, that it's not a good idea. And it's right along the lines of, again, like high fructose corn syrup. So it's really easy to eat a whole bunch of candy, too. Yeah. But the, the high fructose corn syrups tend to bloat, and they I don't think it's a terribly efficient carb source. It just, it bloats you. It, 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 in my, what I have felt myself is it just slows down digestion. It, it just keeps you out here. I guess is the best way to explain it. When I took them out, I didn't have them. And I've had other clients do that, not a ton, but maybe 15 or so in the last few months. And they have said, for the large majority of them, they said the same thing. What I would say is this. Let's say you get to the point where you're loading for a day, and it's not enough. Then I would say this. Instead of the fruit juices, I would go to things like potato starch, like the targo, um, waxy maybe, True Protein makes a very, very cheap potato starch. It sucks as far as taste. But look, you know, when ultimately, look, you got pancakes for taste. Throw down some, you know, some potato starch on top of it. Then you're getting some liquid carbs that I believe are better quality and easier, much easier, more efficient than a fruit juice. All right. See what I'm saying? Um, and again, I, if you have any questions, let me know. I want to run through. These are going to be very quick. The supplements themselves, what to use, whether it be fat burners, or can be, what do I use? Um, to me, the only fat burner out there now that is effective, in my opinion, is Yohimbe and Hydrochloride. Okay? It's relatively inexpensive, whether True Protein, True Protein makes it, and quality is great. I've used other Yohimbe that I've taken, it, and literally, it just, you don't feel it. Number one, you're going to sweat profusely. You know it's working when you get out of cardio because you're going to want to take it before your cardio. It's most effective before cardio, and I'm talking five to ten minutes, like right before cardio, and in the absence of carbs, which if you diet, if you're going and keeping the carbs away from your cardio, it's, it's already, you know, it's already going for it. You'll know it's working because your heart rate will be higher. My opinion is for the first couple weeks, do not take it before you weight train. Because if you're training chess, and I'm, not, I'm using chess as, a, as an example, versus legs or back, you're going to be sucking air going, God, I can't go between these But if you're doing that for cardio and you're keeping your heart rate, you'll be able to not be not go at your cardio as hard for the first week or two while your body's adjusting to the Yohimbian anyway, and you're going to have a higher heart rate, which is a big deal, and you're going to be sweat. It will make you sweat. So you'll know if you don't get those two things, you got crap to go in. Okay? I think that, that is the only thing. You can get into ephedra. You're still in gray area with ephedrine and, and that sort of thing. It was always effective. I still have my issues with them banning it, but it is what it is. God love our government for taking care of us. I mean, where would we be without them? <laughs> uh, as far as other supplements, if you guys have questions about other supplements, even being in the industry and doing what I do and dealing with so many supplements, it's very difficult for me to keep track of all the supplements out there. So yeah, I even had to laugh when you said Redline because I know what it is in the sense I've heard it, but honestly, I can't tell you what's in it because I can't keep track of everything that's out there. It's just crazy. And because I get so many questions about supplements, um, like aspartic acid, aspartic acid is a good one now, but it's starting to show a little problems. I still don't pay attention to it because there's a lot of things that show problems. What I want to do is I want to wait a few months, 
and I'll sit back and totally ignore it. But if I start hearing more noise about it, and I start hearing a lot on different boards and from people that I respect in the industry, then I start paying attention to it. Because if I start paying attention to everything I hear, I just don't have that kind of time. I hear about a lot of um, So if you have any questions about supplements, I'd be happy to answer that. As far as cardio, my rules are simple, and I touched on this before. Do not do any more cardio than you need to. Okay? Use it as a tool. Don't rely on it. The whole, oh, I'm doing cardio six days a week, one hour, to me is bullshit. you got a card cycle going, why wouldn't you cardio cycle? Use it and take it out. Use it and take it out. Look, if you baseline on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, and you're already down two pounds by Thursday or Friday below your baseline, it's a good week. Get rid of your cardio. You don't need it. What's getting rid of cardio do? It takes the ceiling back up. It, it leaves your abs up because your body isn't going to, you're not going to let your body adjust to that amount of cardio and basically rely on it or get used to that level. Take it out. When you put it back in, it's that much more effective. So do as do a small amount of cardio as possible. I'm not saying don't do any, but rely on your diet before your cardio. Use the cardio as a tool. What kind of cardio to do? Don't care. It just doesn't matter. I mean, you can swim. If you have animal sex with your wife or your girlfriend, then have animal sex with your wife or girlfriend. Just make sure you keep checking your heart rate to make sure it's at 130. Okay? Um, swimming, I mean, it really doesn't matter. Swimming. Here's the, here's the why I shouldn't say it doesn't matter. There is one point. You don't want to beat your legs up before a leg session. It's the one where you're stepping. And quite frankly, if you're going to do it, do it right and double step it. That way you're lunging for 30 minutes. And it's brutal. But don't do it the day before a leg session and don't do it the day after. If you have legs on Thursday, then only use the gauntlet once or twice a week and use it Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. So it's not going to affect your leg. Training. Last thing you want to do with cardio too is <clears throat> you don't want to overtrain your legs. It's not going to do you any good to get really lean and have flat legs. So you don't want to do it. You want to find the easiest, basically the easiest form of cardio that can keep your heart rate elevated around the 130. And I know I use at 130. Why everybody's 130? No, but it's a good rule in the sense that it's not high intensity, but it's not so low that it's not doing anything. So when I throw the 130 out there, don't take it as a very black and white, everybody has to do 130. It's just a, it's a guy. Okay? 